Well, good evening, everybody. It's very good to see you all here this evening. Uh, we are, I am so pleased that we have as our lecturer today, uh, Patrick Moore. Uh, I last heard him speak when I was in Toronto earlier this year. It was outstanding. He is, as you know, uh, a former chairman and co-founder of Greenpeace. So he's made an interesting journey, uh, and he is still an environmentalist, but he is something which is, alas, all too rare. He is, he is a rational environmentalist, <laughs> and his present, uh, his present, his latest job is as uh, head of the energy and ecology section of Frontier Public Policy, a leading Canadian think tank. Anyhow, I hope you will forgive me, uh, Patrick, if my introduction, introduction remarks end here. That doesn't, the brevity does not mean any lack of warmth. It is simply that everybody here has come to hear you, they haven't come to hear me. So, over to you. Thank you very much, Nigel. My lords and ladies, ladies and gentlemen, thank you for the opportunity to set out my views on climate change. As I've stated publicly on many occasions, there is no definitive scientific proof through real-world observation that carbon dioxide is responsible for any of the slight warming of the global climate that has occurred during the last 300 years since the peak of the Little Ice Age. If there were such a proof, through testing and replication, it would have been written down for all of us to see. The contention that human emissions are now the dominant influence on climate is simply a hypothesis, rather than a universally accepted scientific theory. It is therefore correct, indeed verging on the compulsory in the scientific tradition, to be skeptical of those who express certainty that the science is settled and the debate is over. But there is certainty beyond a reasonable doubt that CO2 is the building block for all life on Earth and that without its presence in the global atmosphere at sufficient concentration, this would be a dead planet. Yet today our children and our publics are taught that CO2 is a toxic pollutant that will destroy life and bring civilization to its knees. Tonight I hope to turn this dangerous, human-caused propaganda on its head. Tonight I will demonstrate that human emissions of CO2 have already saved life on our planet from a very untimely end. That in the absence of our emitting some of the CO2 back into the atmosphere from whence it came in the first place, most or perhaps all life on Earth would begin to die somewhere around two million years from today. But first, a bit of background. I was born and raised in this tiny floating village in Winter Harbor on the northwest tip of Vancouver Island in the rainforest by the Pacific. So for eight years, myself and a few other children were taken by boat each day to a one-room schoolhouse in the nearby fishing village, as there was no road to either of these places. I didn't realize how lucky I was playing on the tide flats by the salmon spawning streams in the rainforest. This is the view from our cabin there today. Until I was sent off to boarding school in Vancouver where I excelled in science. Eventually doing, whoop, sorry, <laughs> eventually doing undergraduate studies at the University of British Columbia, gravitating to the life sciences, biology, biochemistry, genetics, and forestry the environment and the industry my family has been in for more than 100 years. Then, before the word was known to the general public, I discovered the science of ecology, the science of how all living things are interrelated and how we are related to them. At the height of the Cold War, the Vietnam War, the threat of all-out nuclear war, and the newly emerging consciousness of the environment, I was transformed into a radical environmental activist. I can't seem to get it to go that way anymore. <laughs> while, doing, while, while doing my PhD in ecology in 1971, 
I joined a group of activists who had begun to meet in the basement of the Unitarian Church to plan a protest voyage against U.S. hydrogen bomb testing in Alaska. We proved that a somewhat ragtag-licking group could sail an old fishing boat across the North Pacific Ocean and help change the course of history. That's me under the P. We created a focal point for the media to report on public opposition to the tests. When that H-bomb exploded in November 1971, it was the last hydrogen bomb the United States ever detonated. Even though there were four more tests planned in the series, President Nixon canceled them due to the public opposition we had helped to create. That was the birth of Greenpeace. Flushed with victory, on our way home from Alaska, we were made brothers of the Namgis Nation in their big house at Alert Bay, near my northern Vancouver Island home. For Greenpeace, this began the tradition of the Warriors of the Rainbow, after a Cree Indian legend that says, one day people will come together from all races and creeds to save the earth from destruction. We named our ship the Rainbow Warrior, and I spent the next 15 years in the top committee of Greenpeace on the front lines of the environmental movement around the world as we evolved from that church basement into the world's largest environmental activist organization. Next, we took on French atmospheric nuclear testing in the South Pacific. They proved a bit more difficult than the U.S. nuclear tests. It took years to drive these tests underground at Muro Atoll in French Polynesia. In 1985, under direct orders from President Mitterrand, French commandos bombed and sank the Rainbow Warrior in Auckland Harbor, killing our photographer. Going back to 1975, here I'm driving a small inflatable boat into the first encounter with the Soviet factory whaling fleet in the North Pacific. We confronted the whalers, putting ourselves in front of their harpoons in our little rubber boats to protect the fleeing whales. This got us on television news around the world, bringing the Save the Whales movement into everyone's living rooms for the first time. After four years of voyages, in 1979, factory whaling was finally banned in the North Pacific, and by 1985, in all the world's oceans. Here I'm sitting on a baby seal in 1978 off the east coast of Canada to protect it from the hunter's club. I was arrested and hauled off to jail. The seal was clubbed and skinned, but this picture appeared in more than 3,000 newspapers around the world the next morning. We won the hearts and minds of millions of people who saw the baby seal slaughter as outdated, cruel, and unnecessary. Why did I leave Greenpeace after 15 years in the leadership? When Greenpeace began, we had a strong humanitarian or orientation to save civilization from destruction by all-out nuclear war. That's the peace in Greenpeace. Over the years, the peace in Greenpeace was gradually lost, and my organization, along with much of the environmental movement, drifted into a belief that humans are the enemies of the Earth. I believe in a humanitarian environmentalism because we are part of nature, not separate from it. This means including the social and economic priorities with the environmental ones. The first principle of ecology is that we are all part of the same ecosystem. As Barbara Ward put it, one human family on spaceship Earth. And to preach otherwise teaches that the world would be better off without us. As we shall see later in the presentation, there is very good reason to see humans as essential to the survival of life on this planet. In the mid-1980s, I found myself the only director of Greenpeace International with a formal education in science. My fellow directors proposed a campaign to ban chlorine worldwide, naming it the devil's element. I pointed out that chlorine is one of the elements in the periodic table, one of the building blocks of the universe, and the 11th most common element in the Earth's crust. I argued that the fact that chlorine is the most important element for public health and medicine, adding chlorine to drinking water, was the biggest advance in the history of public health, and the majority of our synthetic medicines are based on chlorine chemistry. This fell on deaf ears, and for me it was the final straw. I had to leave. When I left Greenpeace, I vowed to develop an environmental policy that was based on science and logic as opposed to sensationalism, misinformation, anti-humanism, and fear. Here is the supposed smoking gun of catastrophic climate change, the Keeling Curve 
of CO2 concentration in the Earth's atmosphere since 1959. We presume CO2 was at 280 parts per million at the beginning of the industrial era, before human activity could have caused a significant impact. I accept that most of the rise from 280 to 400 parts per million was caused by human CO2 emissions with the possibility that some of it is due to outgassing from continued warming of the oceans. Nassau tells us that carbon dioxide controls the Earth's temperature, period, in childlike denial of the many other factors involved in climate change. This is reminiscent of Nassau's contention that there might be life on Mars. Decades after it was demonstrated that there was no life on Mars, Nassau continues to use it as a hook to raise public funding for more expeditions to the Red Planet. The promulgation of fear of climate change now serves the same purpose. As Bob Dylan prophetically pointed out, money doesn't talk, it swears, even in one of the most admired science organizations in the world. On the political front, the leaders of the G7 plan to, quote, end extreme poverty and hunger, unquote, by phasing out 85% of the world's energy supply, including 98% of the energy used to transport people and goods, including food. Note that only my Prime Minister, Canadian Stephen Harper, third from left, has the decency to hang his head in shame. <laughs> the emperors of the world appear clothed in this picture, but it was obviously photoshopped. They should be required to stand naked for making such a foolish statement. The world's top climate body, the Intergovernmental on Panel on Climate Change, is hopelessly conflicted by its makeup and its mandate. The panel is composed solely of the World Meteorological Organization, weather forecasters, and, Un and the United Nations Environment Program, environmentalists. Both these organizations are focused primarily on short-term timescales, days to maybe a century or two. But the most significant conflict is with the panel's mandate from the United Nations. They are required only to focus on a change of climate which is attributed directly or indirectly to human activity that alters the composition of the atmosphere and which is in addition to natural climate variability. In other words, they are not mandated to look at anything natural that affects the climate, only human effects. So if the IPCC found that the climate was not being affected by human alteration of the atmosphere, or that it is not dangerous, there would be no need for them to exist. They are virtually mandated to find on the side of apocalypse. Scientific certainty, political pandering, a hopelessly conflicted IPCC, and now the Pope, spiritual leader of the Catholic Church, in a bold move to reinforce the concept of original sin, says the earth looks like, quote, an immense pile of filth, unquote, and we must phase out fossil fuels altogether, even for the poor. And then there is the actual immense pile of filth, fed to us more than three times a day by the green media nexus, a seething cauldron of imminent doom, as if we are already condemned to damnation in hell and there is little chance of redemption. I fear for the end of the Enlightenment. I fear an intellectual gulag with Greenpeace as my prison guards. Let's begin with our knowledge of the long-term history of the Earth's temperature and of CO2 in the Earth's atmosphere. This chart depicts our best inference from various proxies back into the Precambrian when it is believed CO2 was higher for the first four billion years of Earth's history than it has been from the Cambrian period until today. I will focus on the last four, 540 million years since modern life forms evolved. It is glaringly obvious that these two key parameters are in an inverse correlation at least as often as they are in any semblance of correlation. Two clear examples of, of reverse correlation occurred 150 million years ago and 50 million years ago. At the end of the Jurassic, temperature fell dramatically while CO2 spiked. During the Eocene thermal maximum, temperature was likely higher than at any time in the past 550 million years, while CO2 had been on a downward track for 100 million years. This evidence alone 
is sufficient to warrant deep speculation of any claimed lockstep causal relationship between CO2 and temperature. The Devonian period, beginning 400 million years ago, marked the culmination of the invasion of life onto the land. Plants evolved to produce lignin, which in combination with cellulose created wood, which in turn for the first time allowed plants to grow tall in competition with each other for sunlight. As vast forests spread across the land, living biomass increased by orders of magnitude, pulling down carbon as CO2 from the atmosphere to make wood. Lignin is very difficult to break down, and no decomposer species possessed the enzymes to digest it. Trees died atop one another until they were 100 meters or more in depth. This was the making of the great coal beds around the world as this huge store of sequestered carbon continued to build for 90 million years. Then, fortunately for the future of life, a fungi evolved to produce the enzymes that can digest lignin and coincident with that, the coal making era came to an end. There was no guarantee that fungi or any other decomposer species would develop the complex of enzymes required to digest lignin. If they had not, CO2, which had already been drawn down for the first time in Earth's history to levels similar to today's, would have continued to decline as trees continued to grow and die. That is, until CO2 approached the threshold of 150 parts per million, it get down to about 400 at the time, below which plants begin to starve, then stop growing altogether, and then die. Not just woody plants, but all plants. This would bring about the extinction of most, if not all, terrestrial species, as animals, insects, and other invertebrates starved for lack of food. And that would be that. The human species would never have existed. This was only the first time that there was a distinct possibility that life would come close to extinguishing itself due to a shortage of CO2, a molecule essential for life on Earth. This lowly white rot fungus of the genus Trimetes saved life on Earth by evolving the ability to digest lignin. A well-documented graph of global temperature over the past 65 million years shows that we have been in a major cooling period since the Eocene thermal maximum 50 million years ago. The Earth was as much as 16 degrees warmer then, with most of the increased warmth at higher latitudes. The entire planet, including the Arctic and Arct Antarctica, was ice-free and the land there was covered in forests. The ancestors of every species on Earth today survived through what may have been the warmest period in the history of modern life. It makes one wonder about dire predictions that even a two degree rise in temperature from pre-industrial times would cause mass extinctions and the destruction of civilization. Glaciers began to form in Antarctica 30 million years ago and in the northern hemisphere 3 million years ago. Five million years ago there were still giant camels roaming in forests on the Canadian Arctic islands. Today, even in this interglacial period of the Pleistocene Ice Age, we are experiencing one of the coldest climates in the Earth's history. Coming closer to the present, we have learned from Antarctic ice cores that for the past 800,000 years during the Pleistocene Ice Age, there have been quite regular periods of major glaciation followed by interglacial periods in 100,000 year cycles. These cycles coincide with the Milankovitch cycles that are tied to the eccentricity of the Earth's orbit and its axial tilt. It is highly plausible that these cycles are related to solar intensity and seasonal distribution of solar heat on the Earth's surface. There is a strong correlation between temperature and the level of atmospheric CO2 during these geologically fairly short successive glaciations, indicating a possible cause-effect relationship between the two. Carbon dioxide lags temperature by an average of 800 years during the most recent 400,000 year period, the one shown here, indicating that temperature is the cause, as the cause never comes after the effect. Looking at the past 50,000 years of temperature and CO2, we can see that changes in CO2 follow changes in temperature, 
This is as one would expect, as the Milankovitch cycles are far more likely to cause a change in temperature than a change in carbon dioxide. And a change in the temperature is far more likely to cause a change in carbon dioxide due to outgassing of CO2 from the oceans during warmer times and ingassing or absorption of CO2 during colder periods. Yet climate alarmists persist in insisting that CO2 is causing the change in temperature despite the illogical nature of that assertion. It is sobering to consider the magnitude of climate change during the past 20,000 years since the peak of the last major glaciation. At that time, there were 3.3 kilometers of ice on top of what is today the city of Montreal, a city of more than 3 million people. 95% of Canada was covered in an ice sheet. Even as far south as Chicago, there was nearly a kilometer of ice. If the Milankovitch cycle continues to prevail, and there is little reason aside from our CO2 emissions to think otherwise, this will happen gradually again during the next 80,000 years, as we are already about 10,000 years into this interglacial period, which is more or less their average standard length. Will our CO2 emissions stave off another glaciation, as James Lovelock has suggested? There doesn't seem to be much hope of that so far, as despite one-third of all our CO2 emissions being released during the past 18 years, the UK Met Office contends that there has been no statistically significant warming during this century. Coming back to the relationship between temperature and CO2 in the modern era, we can see that temperature has risen at a steady slow rate in central England since before 1700. Well, it started rising around 1700. This goes back further than that even. While human CO2 emissions were not relevant until 1850 and then began an exponential rise after 1950. This is not indicative of a direct causal relationship between the two. Otherwise, they might follow each other a little bit. After freezing over regularly during the 500-year-long Little Ice Age, the River Thames froze for the last time in 1814 as the Earth moved into what might be called the modern warm period. Now we have the great debate over whether there is a pause in global warming or not. Now we can't trust NASA, NOAA, the IPCC, the Australian Bureau of Meteorology, or the CSIRO to be honest with climate numbers. Despite their failing, falling out with the BBC, it seems we can at least trust the UK Met Office, who have clearly stated there's been no significant warming in this century. The lockstep cause-effect relationship upon examination lies shattered under the lens of scientific observation and reason. How many politicians or members of the media or the public are aware of this statement about climate change from the IPCC in 2007? Quote, we should recognize that we are dealing with a coupled, nonlinear, chaotic system, and therefore that the long-term prediction of future climate states is not possible, unquote. This graph confirms that statement. The only trends these computer models seem to be able to predict accurately are the ones that have already occurred. <laughs> Coming to the core of my presentation, carbon dioxide is the currency of life and the most important building block for all life on Earth. All life is carbon-based, including our own. Surely the carbon cycle and its central role as the foundation of life should be taught to our children rather than the demonization of CO2 that carbon is a pollutant. We know for a fact that CO2 is essential and that it must be at a certain level in the atmosphere for the survival of plants, which are the primary food for all the other species alive today. Should we not encourage our citizens, students, teachers, politicians, and other leaders to celebrate CO2 as the giver of life that it is? It is a proven fact that plants, including trees and all our food crops, are capable of growing much faster at higher levels of CO2 than present in the atmosphere today. Even at today's concentration of 400 parts per million, 0.04%, four one-hundredths of one percent, are relatively starved for nutrition. The optimum level of CO2 for plant growth is about five times higher, 2,000 parts per million. Yet the alarmists warn it is already too high. They must be challenged 
every day by every person who knows the truth in this matter. CO2 is the giver of life, and we should celebrate CO2 rather than denigrate it as is the fashion today. We are witnessing the greening of the earth as higher levels of CO2 due to human emissions from the use of fossil fuels promotes increased growth of plants around the world. This has been confirmed by scientists with CSIRO in Australia, in Germany in research forests, and in North America in wild forests. Only half of the CO2 we are emitting from the use of fossil fuels is showing up in the atmosphere. The balance is going somewhere else, and the best science says most of it is going into an increase in biomass of global plant life. What could be wrong with that as forests and agricultural crops become more productive? This is beginning to be accepted more than it was just a year ago in Indir Goklani's paper, which many of you may have seen in GWPF's uh, note yesterday or the day before, uh, is another example of someone coming out with really solid stuff on this. All the CO2 in the atmosphere has been created by outgassing from the Earth's core during massive volcanic eruptions. This was much more prevalent in the early history of the Earth when the core was hotter than it is today. During the past 150 million years, there has not been enough addition of CO2 to the atmosphere to offset the gradual loss due to burial of carbon in the sediments. Let's look at where all the carbon is in the world and how it's moving around. Today, at just over 400 parts per million, there are 850 billion tons of carbon dioxide in the atmosphere. By comparison, when modern life evolved over 500 million years ago, there was nearly 15,000 billion tons of CO2 in the atmosphere, 17 times today's level. Plants and soils combined today account for more than 2,000 billion tons, more than twice as much as the entire global atmosphere. The oceans contain 38,000 billion tons of dissolved CO2, 45 times as much as in the atmosphere, and fossil fuels, which are made from plants that pulled CO2 out of the atmosphere ages ago, account for between 5 and 10,000 billion tons, therefore 6 to 12 times as much carbon as in, is in the atmosphere. Just speaking of fossil fuels, depending on how it's tallied, they account for between 85 to 88 percent of global energy consumption and more than 95 percent of the energy for the transport of people and goods. Yet the green movement insists that we should phase out all fossil fuels, shut down all nuclear plants, and stop building hydroelectric dams. It is obvious that this would be a thousand times more disastrous than a few degrees of warming if it ever happens. The climate alarmist so-called solution to their contrived climate catastrophe is as bankrupt as the claim that climate science is settled. A lot of nasty things are said about fossil fuels, even though they are largely responsible for our longevity, our prosperity, and our personal freedom. Hydrocarbons, the energy component of fossil fuels, are 100% organic as in organic chemistry, which is the chemistry of carbon. They were produced by solar energy in ancient seas and forests. When they are burned for energy, the main products are water and carbon dioxide, the two most essential foods for life, as plants combine them to build the sugars that provide the energy for all living things. And fossil fuels are by far the largest storage battery of solar energy on Earth. Nothing else comes close, except nuclear fuel, which is also solar in the sense that it was produced in dying stars. But the truly stunning number is the amount of carbon that has been sequestered from the atmosphere and turned into carbonaceous rocks. 100 million billion tons, that's one quadrillion tons of carbon, most of which was turned into stone by marine species that learned to make armor plating for themselves by combining calcium and CO2 into calcium carbonate. Limestone, chalk, and marble are all of life origin and amount to over 99% of all the carbon that was ever present in the global atmosphere. The White Cliffs of Dover are made with the calcium carbonate skeletons of coccolithophores, tiny marine plants that provide much of the basis 
for the food chain in the seas. At the beginning of the Cambrian period, 540 million years ago, many marine species of invertebrates evolved the ability to control calcification and to build armor plating to protect their soft bodies. Shellfish, such as clams and snails, corals, coccolithophores, which are plants, foraminifera, the ones, the coccolithophores are these ones, the foraminifera are a little larger, they're animals, that's those ones, began to combine CO2 and calcium and thus to remove carbon from the life cycle as the shells sank into sediments. It is ironic that life itself, by devising a protecting suit of armor, determined its own eventual demise by continually removing CO2 from the atmosphere. This is carbon sequestration and storage writ large. These are the carbonaceous sediments that form the shale deposits from which we are fracking gas and oil today. And I add my support who say, OK, UK, get fracking. <laughs> the past 150 million years has seen a steady drawing down of CO2 from the atmosphere, from here to here. There are many components to this, but what matters is the net effect, a removal on average of 37,000 tons of carbon from the atmosphere every year for 150 million years. The amount of CO2 in the atmosphere was reduced by more than 90% during this period. This means that volcanic emissions of CO2 have been outweighed by the loss of carbon to calcium carbonate sediments on a multi-million year basis. If this trend continues, CO2 will inevitably fall to levels that threaten the survival of plants which require a minimum of 150 parts per million to survive. How long will it be at the pleasant, present level of CO2 depletion until most or all life on Earth is threatened with extinction by lack of CO2 in the atmosphere? During this Pleistocene Ice Age, CO2 tends to reach a minimum level when the successive glaciations reach their peak of cold. During the last glaciation, which peaked 18,000 years ago, CO2 bottomed out at 180 parts per million, possibly the lowest level CO2 has been in the history of the Earth. This is only 30 parts per million above the level that plants begin to die. Paleontological research has demonstrated that even at 180 parts per million, there was a severe restriction of growth as plants began to starve. With the onset of the warmer interglacial period, CO2 rebounded to 280 parts per million. But even today, with human emissions causing CO2 to reach 400 parts per million, plants are still restricted in their growth rate, which would be much higher if CO2 were 1,000 to 2,000 parts per million. Here is the shocking news. If humans had not begun to unlock some of the carbon stored as fossil fuels, all of which had been in the atmosphere before sequestration by plants and animals, life on Earth would have soon been starved of this essential nutrient and would begin to die. Given the present trends of glaciations and interglacial periods, this may have occurred less than two million years from today. A blink in nature's eye, 0.05% of the 3.5 billion year history of life. Now, I don't pretend to have a computer model that can predict the future two million years out, but that is what a simple extrapolation of the data tells us. No other species could have accomplished the task of putting some of the carbon back into the atmosphere that was pulled out and locked into the Earth's crust by plants and animals making fossil fuels over the millennia. This is why I honor independent scientist James Lovelock in my lecture this evening, someone I have admired since he wrote his first book on Gaia. Lovelock was, for many years, of the belief that humans are the one and only rogue species on Gaia, destined to cause catastrophic global warming. I enjoy the Gaia hypothesis, but I'm not religious about it, and for me this was too much like original sin. It was as if humans were the only evil species on Earth. But James Lovelock has seen the light and recanted and realized that humans may actually be part of Gaia's plan, and he has good reason to do so. Uh, and I honor him because it takes great courage for a public figure 
to change their mind after investing so much of their reputation on the opposite opinion. Rather than seeing humans as the enemies of Gaia, Lovelock now sees that we may be working with Gaia to, quote, stave off another ice age, unquote. This is much more plausible than the climate doom and gloom scenario because our release of CO2 back into the atmosphere has definitely reversed the steady downward slide of this essential food for life and hopefully may reduce the chance that the climate will slide into another period of major glaciation. We can be certain that higher levels of CO2 will result in increased plant growth and biomass and help human civilization through another glaciation if such a thing occurs. We really don't know whether or not higher levels of CO2 will prevent or reduce the eventual slide into another major glaciation in this Pleistocene Ice Age. Personally, I'm not very hopeful for this because the long-term history just doesn't support a strong correlation between CO2 and temperature. It does boggle the mind in the face of our knowledge that the level of CO2 has been steadily falling, that human CO2 emissions are not universally acclaimed as a miracle of salvation. From direct observation, we already know that the extreme predictions of CO2's impact on global temperature are highly unlikely given that during the past 18 years there has been no statistically significant warming. And even if there were some additional warming, that would surely be preferable to the extermination of all or most species on the planet. And, and if it does try to go into another ice age, maybe CO2 would just keep it at a nice temperature like this instead of letting it go down six or eight degrees Celsius average global temperature, which would put an another three miles of ice on top of Canada and Russia like during the last one. You heard it here. Human emissions of carbon dioxide have saved life on Earth from inevitable starvation and extinction due to the lack of carbon dioxide. To use the analogy of the atomic clock, if the Earth were 24 hours old, we were at 38 seconds to midnight when we reversed the trend towards end times. If that isn't good news, I don't know what is. You don't get to stave off Armageddon every day. I issue a challenge to anyone to provide a compelling argument that counters my analysis of this historical record and the prediction of CO2 starvation based on the 150 million year trend. Ad hominem arguments about deniers need not apply. I submit that much of society has been collectively misled into believing that global CO2 and temperature are too high when the opposite is true for both. Does anyone deny that below 150 parts per million of CO2 that plants will die? Does anyone deny that the Earth has been in a 50 million year cooling period and that this Pleistocene Ice Age is one of the coldest periods in the history of the Earth. If we assume human emissions have to date added some 200 billion tons of CO2 to the atmosphere, even if we ceased using fossil fuels today, we have already bought another 5 million years for life on Earth. But we will not stop using fossil fuels to power our civilization so it is likely that we can forestall plant starvation for lack of CO2 by at least 65 million years. Even when the fossil fuels have become scarce, we have the quadrillion tons of calcium carbonate, which we know how to term, turn into lime and CO2 for cement production. And we know how to do that with solar energy and nuclear energy. So we have a store of carbon dioxide to be released into the global atmosphere until time immemorial. This alone, regardless of fossil fuel consumption, the burning of carbonate rocks, will more than offset the loss of CO2 due to calcium carbonate burial in the marine sediments. Without a doubt, the human species has made it possible to prolong the survival of life on Earth for more than 100 million years, if we're still around. We are not the enemy of nature, but its salvation. To conclude, carbon dioxide from burning fossil fuels is the stuff of life, the staff of life, the currency of life, indeed the backbone 
of life on earth. I'm very honored to have been chosen to deliver your annual lecture. Thank you for listening to me this evening. I hope you've seen CO2 from a new perspective and will join with me to celebrate CO2. Thank you. Can I just um, say thank you very much, Patrick, for such a thought-provoking lecture, which everyone here in the room enjoyed. The whole purpose of the GWPF is to bring these voices to, to, to have a platform and a forum where these ideas and hypotheses, a very, very important idea that you've um, raised today about uh, the, the drop in CO2 levels over uh, the last 150 years. These are ideas that need a forum. They are not heard in most venues. This is what we are about, and we are so grateful for you to come from Canada to give your presentation and give us food for thought. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. <laughs>